Hello to my 1,000 or so subscribers on this long dormant YouTube channel. As you may know, I've been really busy building this Quaker YouTube channel for Friends Journal for the past six years and haven't been posting much here. So thanks for sticking with me. I actually just announced that I'm going to be passing on the directorship of that channel to someone new, and so I'm back for the moment. If you're just joining us from the Quaker Speak channel, welcome. I hope that you'll subscribe to me here on this YouTube channel and also uh, sign up for my newsletter. I've put the link to that below this video. So since I'm wrapping up my time at Quaker Speak, I thought it would be a good time to tell the story real quick about how I came up with the idea for Quaker Speak and how it got launched. Just a heads up, I'll mention some projects and videos that were instrumental in setting up the idea for Quaker Speak, and I made a playlist with all those videos in it that I'll share. Uh, that link is below this video and it should pop up at the very end. So without further ado, the story of Quaker Speak. So in order to get started with the story of Quaker Speak, we have to rewind a little bit to 2006. I was a senior at Guilford College, and for the Quaker Leadership Scholars program there, I had to do a senior project. And I decided to write some songs about the early Quakers. James Naylor hadn't slept for days. He had a letter in his pocket. I didn't know much From about the early Georgia Quakers, so in order to do some research, I did some reading, and I also and interviewed one of my mentors at Guilford. His name is Max Carter. And there was certainly opposition to any kind of dancing, because it was seen as stirring up the passion. You make the vertical expression of a horizontal desire. Uh, naval battles had a lot of seamen. Uh, that sort of stuff. And Max really surprised me by telling me all of these super interesting, engaging stories about Quakers in the 17th century, like the one about James Naylor riding into the city of Bristol on a donkey, and um, Solomon Eccles burning all of his violins and manuscripts in a public square in London. And I said, wow, these are uh, really intense stories, and I want to write songs about this. instruments and his lovely violin so I ended up taking the recording of the interview with Max and basing an entire album of music on the stories that he shared with me and even using some of the audio from that tape recorder um, in the songs that I had written. Early fans believe that they were restoring original Christianity and uh, in their own experience, there was no need for programming in him and rites and rituals and liturgies because they had the very presence of the living God. I invited a bunch of other Quaker musicians at Guilford to come record with me, and at the end of my senior year, we released it as an album called A Few Songs Occasioned by the Spirit. The year after I graduated from Guilford College, I went to live at this Quaker retreat center out just outside of Philadelphia called Pendle Hill. At Pendle Hill, I wrote some more songs about Quakers, but this time more autobiographical, about my own Quaker journey, growing up Quaker in Baltimore Yearly Meeting and the camping program and the Young Friends program there. One of the autobiographical songs that I wrote about growing up Quaker, I decided to make into a music video. The song is called Friend Speaks My Mind, and the idea behind the music video was it was going to be a silent Quaker worship where I stand up and start giving vocal ministry, but the vocal ministry is this song, Friend Speaks My Mind, and then friends around me get inspired and start tapping their toes and playing instruments, and then eventually the whole thing just erupts into a raucous dance party. So all you friends in the meeting house, put your hands up and then twist them at the wrist like you just got out of handcuffs and clap for me. You gotta clap silently, that's how you clap for me. So we filmed this music video at Pendle Hill and released it on YouTube. We called it Dance Party Erupts During Quaker Meaning for Worship. Um, posted that on YouTube and then I went on a camping trip. <laughs> 
So when I got back from that camping trip, the video, Dance Party Erupts in Quaker Meaningful Worship, had thousands of views. Um, the comment section was full of people debating theology and saying they loved the video and saying they hated the video. And, um, and I had an, an inbox full of emails from Quakers in New Zealand and Quakers in England and Quakers in places I didn't even know that there were Quakers. To this day, people will stop me and ask me if I'm the Dance Party Erupts guy. So there was so much engagement and rich conversation around the dance party video, I started asking myself some questions like, what does Quakerism look like in the age of the internet? Um, is there a historical precedent for this kind of interconnection and ability to communicate across geographical lines? What's going to be the impact of the internet on the, on the currently kind of siloed branches of Quakerism? How will the internet affect the way that Quakers communicate about Quakerism to seekers? And finally, how do we begin to answer some of the big but basic questions that seekers have about Quakers? Like, are we Christian? What do we believe? Why do we worship in silence? Are we Amish? Did we invent Quaker oats? You know, stuff like that. And I started to wonder if maybe these questions were actually an opportunity, rather than getting off into the weeds about splits and separations and history lessons, if we could actually answer these questions in ways that felt faithful and like a spiritual invitation. So while I was asking these questions, inspired by my experience with the dance party erupts during Quaker Meeting for Worship video, I was recording another album. Like clothe yourself in righteousness, you don't need that business suit, you don't need that law degree to be free or to speak the truth. I said, my friend Maggie was writing a pamphlet about early Quakers going naked as a sign in the 17th century, and I wrote and released an album that was called Clothe Yourself in Righteousness that was about these early Quakers who decided to strip off their clothes and go through the streets of England naked. But I'm here to tell you, Adam, I'm shedding all your shame. I'm throwing off this clothing and I'm dancing in the rain. I've got a lot The music lose, video that we made truth, for Clothe Yourself in Righteousness was filmed at Guilford College. And I went back to my mentor, Max Carter, and I said, will you be in this music video? <laughs> um, Thankfully, he agreed. So Max's role in the video was that he was going to give a short lecture about the origins of Quakerism, um, and the students in his class were going to sort of ditch class when we all streaked by. We'll start off with radicalism. Let's get naked, let your shame fall away like shedding blank. We make this music video, put it up online, it's called Quakers Get Naked and Meeting for Worship or something like that. So when we posted the music video, we decided to also simultaneously post the brief lecture that Max had given, because it was actually pretty interesting. Um, I came back and checked the two videos about a week later, and Max's lecture was doing better than my music video. How do you understand the beginnings of Quakerism? For some, it was a mystical movement, Rufus Jones. For some, it was a movement out of radical Puritanism, left-wing Puritanism, Hugh Barber. So that was it. There was just something going on with Quakers and YouTube. There's some sort of demand for concise, succinct, interesting explanations about Quakers. And I could think of a million different topics that could use this kind of treatment, and I could think of a million different Quakers whose stories I wanted to tell in this format. So the gears started turning. I realized for this to have its maximum impact, it should probably be a standalone project. It should probably have its own branding and its own title. And when I was doing research into successful YouTube channels, one of the pillars that I noticed about a successful YouTube channel is that they release content consistently. That you'll see a YouTube channel that releases two videos a week or one video a week, but you know what day they're gonna release it on. So I had all these light bulbs going off, but I didn't have the capacity to take on a project of this scope. Um, certainly not with the zero dollars a year that I was making as a Quaker singer songwriter. So I entered this phase of trying to pitch the project to different organizations in Philadelphia, trying to find the funding and the home uh, where something like this could be taken in. 
So I was seeking funding and I was seeking a home for this Quaker YouTube channel that I had decided would be called Quaker Speak. Quaker Speak is normally a term that Quakers use to describe something that's kind of insidery, unapproachable language. But I thought it would be kind of cool to flip that on its head and say, no, Quaker Speak is really actually grounded, faithful communication. So there was this sort of funny period where I was wandering around Philadelphia um, talking to anybody I could about this project and handing out these postcards. Let's see, I've got them over here. Um, it's, uh, let's see if I can get this in focus. And uh, here's what it says. It says, the internet has become the great equalizer of communication, making accessible a breadth of information unimaginable in scope. But where are the Quakers? The next generation of friends are already out there Googling Quakers and searching for engaging material on YouTube. Let's give them something to get excited about. The Quaker Speak project aims to provide exactly that, using the internet to widely distribute video interviews with friends whose ministries inform us, uplift us, and challenge us. Quaker Speak is a YouTube channel. Its goal is to release weekly short videos tailored for an internet audience starting in fall of 2013. Did it! <laughs> As fate would have it, around this time, I was invited to come into the Friends Journal office to do an interview about the Dance Party Erupts video. I believe that the internet is the new printing press. The, um, the early Quakers um, had a vibrant message that they were trying to aggressively spread and that they were very passionate about and they wanted people to hear. And the printing press was new technology in the 1650s, or at least it was technology that was suddenly available to everyone. So the Quakers embraced that. They said, we've got this message, there's this new platform, we're going to get it out there and we're going to do that aggressively. So and while I was here, I pitched the idea for the Quaker Speak channel. We then worked together to start identifying potential funding and I started doing some interviews with friends to put together a proposal video for these different funding organizations. Quakerism arose in a time of great change in English history. Now, a woman was saying, My, the chair I'm sitting on is connected to war. By being trusted, I then trusted. And I wasn't capable of being guided until after having trust bestowed on me. There's some reasons why Quakers could play a very strong and helpful role, a really healthy role, in the climate justice movement. I'll spare you the mundane details of the funding story, but the long and short of it is about a year later, funding got approved. I was brought on officially to Friends Journal as the director of the Quaker Speak project. And a couple months later, we released our first video, appropriately with Max Carter, entitled How Quakerism Began. George Fox was one of the leaders of that, that movement, but he wasn't alone in that, but has become a major figure in understanding the origins of Quakerism. Uh, he became tired of what he saw as hypocrisy in the church of his uh, youth and about the age of 19. He left the church, uh, started wandering about seeking a direct spiritual experience that spoke to his condition. Of course, a lot has happened since then. The project has blossomed into this international resource for friends and seekers. I've gotten to interview hundreds of Quakers for the project, and we've released over 200 videos. The project has over 2.7 million views. Thinking back to those humble beginnings with a tape recorder, it's hard to conceive how far we've come in such a short time. Thanks so much for listening to this epic story about the history and origins of the Quaker Speak channel. As promised, there's a playlist of all the videos I mentioned as significant in leading up to the founding of the project. I do hope you'll stay in touch with me as I discern my next leading. You can sign up for my newsletter at my website, johnmotts.com. I'll put the link below this video. Thanks so much for watching and have a great Thursday.